Oh, Robin, there's this really cool quote in our reading. Really? Yeah, listen to this. It's about African American soldiers coming back from the war. Hmm. We return. We return from fighting. We return fighting. How intense is that? Hmm. We had to read W.B. Du Bois this weekend, right? Yeah, it's from Returning Soldiers of his. It's really good, actually. Hmm. It's really funny. That's the same title as the library. I wonder if it's the same person. Could there be more than one W.B. Du Bois? Very valid point. Unlikely. You know, I'm going to look it up and see if there is more than one W.B. Du Bois. Emily. What? You will never believe this. W.B. Du Bois is from Great Barrington, Massachusetts. That's only like an hour and a half from here. We have now arrived in Great Barrington! <laughs> Alright, birthplace of W.B. Du Bois, incorporated 1761 in this... In February of 1867, Mary Sylvina Burkhart married Alfred Du Bois and lived in this really small house owned by a former South Carolina slave in this area. However, Alfred Du Bois ended up leaving because Mary's cousins harassed him. So then, Du Bois was left with his mother, and 30 years later, the house that they used to live in was raised to make way for an electrical manufacturing plant. It's just over right there. So. At present, it's just a parking lot and a plant, but this is the site of W.B. Du Bois' birthplace. This is where Du Bois was born on February 23rd, 1868, and at this end, it's important to note that at this point in time, Ray Harrington was made up mainly of European Americans, and at best estimates of the approximately 4,000 people in the town at the time, only 100 of them were African American, including Du Bois and his mother. But Du Bois says, if you can't read the sign about his birth, I was born by a golden river and in the shadow of two great hills, five years after the Emancipation Proclamation. So, because he grew up among so many white people, Du Bois, the, oh, Du Bois, this was one, probably one of the reasons that Du Bois said to reflect, one often feels his two-ness, an American, a Negro, two souls, two thoughts, unreconciled strivings, two warning ideals in one dark body, whose dogged strength alone keeps from being turned asun torn asunder. This marks the W.B. Du Bois boyhood home site. Du Bois moved here when he was about two years old, and he lived here until he was six with a couple of professional and several members of his extended family. Du Bois has said that this homestead is the first home that he ever remembered. Oh. Conveniently enough, today, this site is maintained by the UMass Campus Library and other, members, and other members of communities around here. Through those trees over there is the African American Heritage Trail. And herein lies the tragedy of the age. Not all men are poor. All men know something of poverty. Not that men are wicked. Who is good? Not that men are ignorant. What is truth? Nay, but that men know so little of men. W.B. Du Bois, The Souls of Black Folk. Oh, cool. Now is the accepted time. Not tomorrow. Not some more convenient season. It is today that our best work can be done, and not some future day or future year. It is today that we fit ourselves for the greater usefulness of tomorrow. Today is the seed time. Now are the hours of work, and tomorrow comes the harvest and the playtime. Obviously, this is not a school now. It's the Berkshire Market, but way back in the day, back right where this parking lot used to be, is where W.B. Du Bois went to high school. And he excelled academically here, especially under the tutelage of the principal, Frank Hosmer, who recommended that Du Bois take college preparatory classes rather than go down the traditional route and just train to go into agriculture and become a farmer here in Great Barrington. It's also been noted by his teachers that as early as age 15, which is also coincidentally the age at which he graduated high school, Du Bois showed an interest in his race and helping his race progress and advance through in the United States of America, specifically through education, which, which was to become a major theme for the rest of his life's work. Cool. Du Bois was also noted as saying, a little less complaint and whining, and a little more dogged work and manly striving would do us more credit than a thousand civil rights bills. This just goes to show that instead of just getting some legislature passed to help black people assume their equality in society, he was really focused on educating black people to help them advance. So, um, later in life, Mary Du Bois, W.B. Du Bois' mother,
mother became increasingly disabled, so they moved from their original house to a house behind the horse stables of this church. This is the first congregational church founded in the 1700s, and they ended up joining this church. Over here, 
is the river that he spent so much of his life loving right by his childhood home. The Housatonic River, speech of W.E.B. Du Bois 84 at the annual meeting of the alumni of Cyrus High School in 1930. In the earlier days, even before this anniversary we're celebrating in Massachusetts now, this valley must have been a magnificent sight. The beautiful mountains on either side, thickly covered with massive trees, and in the midst of it all, the Housatonic River rolling in great flood, winding here and there, stretching now and then into lakes which are our present meadows and so hurrying always on toward the sea. And I think everyone would realize then and now that the river was the center of the picture. In a sense, the mountains exist for the river, and no matter how much one might climb their sides, they look back upon the river as the central beauty of the panorama. What has happened? The thing that has happened in this valley has happened in hundreds of others. The town, the whole valley, has turned its back upon the river. They have sought to get away from it. They have neglected it. They have used it as a sewer, a drain, a place for throwing their waste and their offal. Mills, homes, and farms have poured their dirt and refuse into it. Outhouses and dung heaps have lined its banks. Almost as if by miracle some beauty still remains in places where the river for a moment, free of its enemies and tormentors, dark and exhausted under its tall trees, has sunk back to vestiges of its former charm in great, slow, breathless curves and still murmurs. But for the most part, the Housatonic has been transformed into an ugly, disgraceful thing. We have crossed it with bridges of unbelievable ugliness, we have choked the flow of its waters, and we have done this not only by filling up the river with refuse, but by denuding the guardian hillsides of their trees and shutting off the brooks. But I wonder if one phase of our difficulty is not illustrated by our treatment of the Housatonic. We turn our backs upon the natural center of the river and try to make the center Main Street. Mr. Sinclair Lewis has proved to us that Main Street cannot be the center of real civilization. And for this valley, the river must be the center. Certainly it is the physical center, perhaps in a sense the spiritual center. You know we are judged by what we neglect. The new gown may be quite perfect, but the other matters of dress betray the untrained and uncouth. Perhaps the very freeing of spirit which will come from giving up our attempt to do the impossible, from ignoring of our greatest source of beauty and completeness, and degrading it with filth and refuse, perhaps from that very freeing of spirit will come other freedoms and inspirations and aspirations which may be steps toward the whole vast problem of country life and the diffusion and diversification and enriching of culture throughout this land. Even if this vision sounds fantastic to the severely practical, certainly the cleansing of the Housatonic will mean better health, less typhoid, safer recreation, and lovelier vistas of beauty. And so I have ventured to call the attention of the graduates of the Cyrus High School this bit of philosophy of living in this valley, urging that we should rescue the Housatonic and clean it as we have never in all the years thought before of cleaning it, and seek to restore its ancient beauty, making it the center of a town, of a valley, and perhaps, who knows, of a new measure of civilized life. Obviously, growing up in western Massachusetts, in a very good community, Du Bois experienced little of the racism that many of his other people experienced growing up. It wasn't until he went down south to college, to university in Tennessee, that he saw the poverty and other issues that his people were dealing with. However, teaching in a, teaching in a summer school in near Fisk University for two summers, he grew to really understand what his people were dealing with, but, and he became not discouraged, but inspired by how his people were so willing to learn, and how much they really, and how much they were truly willing to work to better their lives. So it was, it was this experience that, that made Du Bois really keen on the idea of education for his people. Look, however, du, however, even through an organization of its founding, the NAACP, it didn't always stick to Du Bois' ideals. So in 1934, he resigned from the organization in anger that the organization was focusing more on middle-class blacks, or the black bourgeoisie, and not focusing on the mass of the blacks down south. Still, in that time, most blacks were not middle-class and still living in terrible conditions, especially in poorer states down south, such as Alabama and Mississippi. Yep. Black Goat does 
discuss the, the terrible effects that racism had on blacks in this country. It also really celebrated black history. He talked about uh, their, when he talked about their music and their strength and their pride and religion and the reconstruction of freedom. And another big part of this was black folks reflections of W. E. Woods and his son, Burkhart, who died. As Emily said earlier, his son's death that influenced the rest of his life very heavily. Debbie Du Bois also wrote The Dusk of Dawn, and uh, his boyhood in right here in Western Massachusetts, so it was a big part of this. And it, but this book also goes on to describe his youth at Michigan Harvard, his travels abroad, his goal in founding the NAACP and his long association with it. And it's really an attempt to, to really describe what he sees as the race problem in their work. And you might also find that the written accounts of his sociological studies and the many essays and articles that he was written here in the library. The conflicts in Du Bois' life did not end with his conflicts with the NAACP. In 1961, he officially joined the Communist Party and left the United States for, Af for Ghana in Africa, renouncing his American citizenship almost a year later. Du Bois died on August 27, 1963, in, in Accra, the capital of Ghana. Unfortunately, we do not have the money nor the means to go to Ghana and see his grave here, but his, but his first wife, Nina Gomer Du Bois, is buried right here in Great Barrington. His two children with her, Yolanda and Burkhart, are buried very near here, although their graves are unmarked with stones. At Du Bois's funeral, one of, the, one of his more famous quotes was read, Believe in life. All human beings will progress to a greater, broader, and fuller life. is actually the coolest place in the world. Why is it the coolest place in the world? They have a Walt Disney quote on the Episcopal Church. It's kind of fun to do the impossible. Right, Robin? Always, Emily. What would complete a Robin and Emily literary adventure without
great literary adventures complete without ice cream and sorbet. We have word from the woman at the visitor center that this is the best ice cream in the world. So we'll what see. What do you she think, Robin? What do you think? She speaks the truth. <laughs> Sorbet, Em. It's like really, really good. It's what? Oh my gosh. This what? A what? A disco ball. Oh my god, that's so legit. That is the coolest thing I've ever seen. This is a disco ball in the Soko Creamery in Great Barrington, Massachusetts. Jared.